The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to MLA's Productivity and Profitability Webinar Series. Just bear with me as I fix up some screens here. Sorry. Uh, okay, so um, great to have you all on board tonight. My name is Peter Havilland. I work for uh, Aggregate Consulting and we coordinate the webinars on behalf of uh, NLA. So tonight we're fortunate to have uh, John Webware from the McKinnon Project with us. Um, and he will be presenting on the topic of livestock staggers for Phalaris and ryegrass based pastures. So just bear with me, I'll go to our next screen. Sorry, John, I'll just have to grab back. I'm, on, I'm still sharing your screen. Yep, okay. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Okay, we're right now. Okay, so as I said, we've got uh, Dr. John Webware on board from the McKinnon Project, and um, John predominantly is a senior consultant for the McKinnon Project, based out of Parkville, Victoria, advising beef and sheep producers. Um, he obviously regularly presents to farming groups such as tonight um, and he's involved on various committees and uh, a lesser part of his role is also as a senior lecturer at the University of Melbourne. So um, a trained vet, research um, under his belt, a very knowledgeable gentleman um, and, and in all his spare time he also runs a joint operation of sheep and beef. So uh, before we get into it and hand over to John, I will just jump back and we'll go through. Uh, control panel, basically you shouldn't have to do too much tonight. You can minimise the screen by utilising this arrow here. Um, I'll also point out that you won't be able to uh, verbally ask any questions, but you can type your questions here. Okay. so. Um, at the end of the webinar, if you um, if you have to log off early, it will be recorded uh, so you can go back to it. And uh, we really appreciate your feedback on the event. So um, please uh, complete the exit survey. And as I said, if you've got any technical difficulties or um, you want to ask questions, please utilise your questions and your chat uh, function. So I think that's me done, John. I will hand over to you now. Okay. Okay. Can you see? Okay. Yep, that looks good. Thanks, John. I'll go okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks very. Yep, I'll get into it. So thanks very much, uh, Peter, for the introduction. Um, look, look tonight. Um, I'm going to be, as Peter mentioned, going to be talking about uh, uh, staggers in sheep and cattle, but also um, um, uh, I'm focusing on uh, perennial ryegrass based pastures and uh, Polaris based pastures. Uh, so, and I guess there's two or, th or three syndromes which I want to talk about primarily. Uh, firstly, the first one, perennial ryegrass, staggers which is more technically called perennial ryegrass toxicosis because it's not only about staggers there's a number of other different issues which i'll uh, talk about tonight which cause production losses in livestock um, also with um, and then talk about phalaris staggers and phalaris toxicity or, or a sudden death syndrome which they're quite distinct um, syndromes they can happen on the same place in the same year um, or you can get one or the other or none and I really want to go through these um, uh, uh, syndromes, toxicities, and how to manage and, and, and uh, treat uh, uh, these uh, uh, syndromes on, on your farm. 
So if I start about um, perennial ryegrass toxicosis, it, it's, uh, there's about 6 million hectares of uh, agricultural areas in Australia which uh, can uh, uh, run a perennial ryegrass pastures. And the vast majority of the ryegrass pastures are still of the older uh, perennial ryegrass pastures in, in Victoria. We call it Victorian perennial um, ryegrass. And it, it, and like all the old um, ryegrass pastures, they, they have um, a fungus um, or what's uh, called an endophyte, which actually lives within a fungus, which lives within the uh, leaf stem and even the seed. And you can see the photo, um, a high resolution photo down the bottom where the, the, the fungal strands or hyphae are uh, died as, as uh, in, a, in the leaf of a perennial ryegrass plant. And in, in uh, the older type perennial ryegrass, so let's call it Victorian perennial ryegrass, it, it um, produces, uh, the fungus uh, produces alkaloids, uh, which um, there's three main ones uh, in, in, in wild type perennial ryegrass, Loliotrum B, Ergobalene and Peramine, and I'll go into them in detail, but they're important for both the plant um, and uh, also the animal in terms of the plant is a positive benefit in terms of the toxins produced by the endophytes uh, help the plant resist insect uh, attack um, um, and uh, keep those pests away and uh, aid in the plant persistence and, and production. However, I mean, that's a very good symbiotic relationship, but the downside of that is uh, there's also animal production impacts with some of the alkaloids. Now, some of those are quite obvious uh, direct impacts, such as what you see with the staggers, but there's also a lot of subclinical effects, uh, which, which are surprising how much impact they can have on livestock performance. So whilst um, um, big perennial ryegrass is, is the basis, still the basis of a lot of our pastures, there is a, a serious downside um, in terms of animal performance uh, with, with those older type ryegrass pastures. But the positive about those pastures, um, they're still productive and they're highly uh, persistent in, in the right environment. So, and one thing is as we, we try and improve productivity, uh, um, having uh, one of those uh, key elements of higher productivity and profitability is ensuring we've got um, adequate soil fertility. And there's, um, there was a really good trial which was run for many years down at um, uh, the PVI down at um, Hamilton uh, and uh, what, what's called the long-term phosphate trial. I gather unfortunately it's just um, it's just ceased it, although it's been in care, caretaker mode for uh, quite a few years now. But this um, graph shows the different um, uh, pasture species present at different long-term levels of um, phosphorus application, starting off at one and four, very low. Eight is getting close to the district average and, and 15 and 23 in very high levels. But the, the green um, in that uh, graph shows that the proportion of uh, ryegrass in uh, the, the pastures, and these were old uh, ryegrass pastures, but you can see that uh, as you increase um, phosphorus uh, up to a point, up to at least eight to 15 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare per annum, um, then the uh, a proportion of ryegrass rapidly increases. So one of the issues um, um, is, is you, if you have high fertility um, uh, soils, you, you tend to promote the more desirable pasture species. And so ryegrass is one of them, which is great from a production point of view from carrying capacity in one, one extent, but also uh, it, it, with a denser ryegrass pastures, it may create more problems, which I'll go into. So what is um, perennial ryegrass toxicosis? Well, in the first instance, we've got um, uh, staggers and, um, and, and that's the most obvious thing. And, and, and the classic uh, syndrome with uh, ryegrass staggers is if you go into the paddock and stimulate them a bit, just uh, push them along a bit, suddenly you'll see animals which appeared normal when they try and move, um, they, they start to stagger. Uh, stagger. Uh, they will have a, it's uh, quite normal to have a fine head tremor on those animals. And when they actually try and move, they'll 
often have a stiff bounding gait with their legs um, and they go uh, down in the hind legs off, off, and it's almost sitting in a dog-like position. Um, but as it gets more severe um, or more uh, pressure, uh, they will become uh, recumbent and in more severe cases, uh, they, they may not, they may become cast and not be able to get up without assistance. Um, and also there's death by misadventure um, in terms of uh, going to have a, a drink of water at a dam and, and uh, uh, drowning, um, but, and, and, and so on. So staggers is, um, uh, and it can uh, affect low numbers to almost 90% of a mob. Um, um, and um, the other thing, um, uh, uh, about that is usually it's the younger sheep which are much more susceptible to the uh, staggers. Now, a, a, a syndrome which is not nearly as obvious as the staggers is that um, is heat stress. So animals which um, um, have uh, ingesting one of the alkaloids, ergovalone, um, uh, lose their ability to manage um, heat, heat loss and heat control. Now you can see in the photo just to the side is that uh, these animals there um, are huddling under um, a bit of um, um, uh, shade cloth. Um, and now that day is not a particularly hot day when that photo was taken, but these animals are being supplemented with a, um, a treatment to absorb the toxin. Now, um, in the neighbouring paddock as part of this trial, um, the actual ones which uh, weren't given the toxin, um, weren't given the uh, supplement, were actually, none of them were in the shade uh, and were showing signs of uh, some heat stress. So it, it, they seemed to lose their ability to seek and control the temperature and one of those things uh, to go in, in to seek out sh uh, sh shade. Now, another thing with um, perennial ryegrass toxicosis, you, you do um, certainly get more scouring uh, uh, when sheep are grazing um, uh, toxic pastures. Um, and they're probably the main Pretty obvious things, although the heat stress is certainly not obvious, and the scouring is usually fairly subtle. Um, but the signs after you uh, remove animals from toxic pastures, um, uh, it takes about two or three weeks. Particularly, say if you get good autumn rains, uh, fresh growth, uh, which has lower levels of alkaloids, um, it takes a couple of weeks for the uh, signs to diminish down to insignificant. Um, Ironically, the, the, the alkaloids are quite lipophilic, so they can, um, uh, if they've had high doses um, of, of alkaloids, uh, it can reside in the fat. And when they metabolize their fat, the animals over a longer period of time, time can have production losses associated with extend, uh, just constant access to um, the alkaloids as they mobilize their fat. With regard to the diagnosis, it's usually based on clinical signs um, and grazing um, a, a, a perennial ryegrass uh, staggers, uh, perennial ryegrass dominant pasture and the clinical signs. But it, it, it can be confirmed by brain histology. You can also take um, alkaloid um, uh, pasture samples to measure alkaloid levels. And also, you, uh, I'm not quite sure whether it's available now, but um, um, uh, fecal um, uh, alkaloid levels too can be measured. Uh, as a measure of the um, sh uh, sheep or, or cattle ingestion of alkaloids off the pasture. Um, usually we don't bother with that because it's usually fairly obvious. There's a raft of different um, alkaloids. Um, Lolliotrim B um, it is in, um, is in uh, two of the endophytes. Uh, SE is the standard endophyte or the wild type endophyte um, in, in Vic Perennial. So it's got a lot of um, um, Elolia trim B and uh, NE um, is another um, endophyte, it's a commercial endophyte that has got a tiny bit of Lolia trim B but not enough to cause staggers. But uh, Lolia trim B is a key proponent which uh, a toxin which causes staggers. Ergovalene, um, it's in also in the standard endophyte, um, it's also in a couple, a couple of the other uh, commercial endophytes, endo5 and NE. Um, but again, it's got minimal in the NEAT and not as much in the endo-5. Um, and ergovalene causes heat stress. Then there's um, uh, pyramines, which are in a, a range of endophytes, wild type and, and commercial endophytes. And also uh, uh, in fescues also have endophytes, um, and, uh, but it's slightly different endophyte lowlands. 
low lines, but they cause uh, no animal production impact. Now, the final one is the Jantha trim, which is in one of the more popular um, in commercial endophytes, AR37, and it can actually cause moderate staggers, okay? So, um, uh, not as severe as uh, uh, staggers caused by low trim B, but still significant staggers all the same. Now, just in terms of where the um, endophytes are, uh, you've got a dry pasture there, but if you delve underneath it, you then split it into the dry and green. At, at the base of the plant, you'll have um, in, in, in late summer and autumn, uh, the, the green, uh, the fresh, fresh green growth, or often moisture stress at that time of the year, is in the, uh, the crown of the plant is where uh, there's a lot of endoph endophyte um, resides. But it's also in the stem and the sheath, um, and also in the in the endophytes are also in the seed, but particularly high levels in in the green pick, which uh, sheep will often chase in summer and autumn. Now this is here just as much for reference. You can go back and have a look at it later on. Uh, but there, I, I I modified this out of a couple of the commercial um, uh, uh, brochures and um, a, a couple of papers. But it just shows what um, insect pests, what endophytes. Are, uh, protective with uh, different you know, insect pests. Now, the main ones, which um, the wild type endophyte pretty much uh, covers um, Argentine's uh, stem weevil, mealy bug, and black beetle. It does a little bit on root aphid, not that effectively, uh, which is an important pest of ryegrass. Uh, no effect on uh, cockchafers and, and the like. Now, um, um, AR1 is, is um, uh, it's protective against um, Argentine stem weevil and mealybug, common, but uh, virtually no impact on black beetle. So in areas where there's um, uh, black beetle, um, uh, AR1 is pretty much useless because um, it doesn't pr protect against the most serious pest. Um, NAA2, it, it, it has a fairly wide spectrum of activity. AR37 has a higher spectrum of activity um, uh, and it um, it has a tiny effect on, on uh, grubs, but not, not, not material, unfortunately. Um, Endo5, um, which is the ergovalene one, um, it, it's uh, got a broad spectrum of activity uh, against the uh, common pests as well. U2, um, uh, which is um, in uh, f uh, fescues and festuoliums, uh, a hybrid uh, f fescue, um, and uh, it, it's actually got a wider spectrum of activity and actually even has some activity against uh, crickets as well. So, uh, but none of the other endophytes have any uh, cricket activity. Um, so in terms of, so it's important when you select endophytes for your area, you understand um, what, what pests you've got. They're pretty widespread, most of the pests, but black beetles are one where, which isn't perhaps quite as widely spread, um, but, um, but I've certainly seen people uh, plant ryegrass with AR1 and uh, it's been smashed in one year with black beetles. Um, with regard to stock impact um, with the different um, um, endophytes, um, nil endophyte ryegrass has um, no um, staggers or animal uh, production impacts. But the problem with nil endophyte or low endophyte varieties, um, that, that they, uh, the problem there is that they um, um, uh, won't uh, handle insect uh, attack. There's one company which is selecting uh, 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 varieties specifically with no, no endophyte, but uh, 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 still persistent. Um, and, and, and look, they, they have some role to play uh, because they're, they're safe. But uh, at, at the end of the day, it's really important if you're going to sow a new pasture, you want to make sure it's going to persist. And so um, uh, whichever cultivar you select. Now, the, the, the good thing about wild type uh, is that it's highly uh, persistent uh, because it, attack, it's, it, 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 it is very good activity against um, uh, uh, all the uh, important pests. Uh, but the problem is wild type has some significant impacts, uh, animal production impacts, both in high, high, very high risk of staggers, but also other animal performance impacts with the ergovalene in particular as well. Uh, cattle also um, can have uh, severe staggers, not quite as bad as sheep usually, and, and but still uh, animal performance issues. AR1, uh, it's as safe as um, 
um, it's as safe as um, nilendophyte. It has a little bit more spectrum of activity, but not enough in my opinion. Uh, NEAT2 NEAT um, um, has a pretty good spectrum um, of activity um, and it, it is, it's actually a pretty safe, uh, very safe for livestock. Um, AR37, the only downside of AR37 is that it can cause issues in, um, in uh, it can cause um, issues with daggers in sheep. I haven't seen it in cattle, but certainly in sheep. Uh, but uh, no real material production impacts. Um, Endo 5, um, I put the animal performance in bracket because I'm not exactly sure what the impact is from the information I was, I was reading, but uh, certainly very safe from the stagger's point of view because it, um, uh, no, no, uh, no loliotrim or jantin in, in, in the Endo 5 Endo 5. Okay, so enough of that, um, uh, but it's important to understand the different endophytes and, um, and balance the animal performance benefits with um, uh, in, uh, resistance against insect attack, which in my opinion is really important. So just in turn, drilling down a bit more on the direct effects of perennial ryegrass um, toxicosis is, um, is, is, and apart from the obvious staggers is, uh, and, heat, and heat stress, is, um, there's plenty of trials which show uh, I mean, a reduction in in, uh, in body weight of sheep of between two and five kilograms. Now that can be in a sh relatively short term period, or it can be over a longer term period. I'll show a graph in a minute where there's a five kilogram difference of crossbred ewes um, over a 300 day period, even when when the uh, pastures were safer uh, with low endophyte, even in winter. But you, you extrapolate that to um, fertility in a in a meat sheep or in any sort of sheep, and it's really significant. Deaths usually pretty low in most years, but in bad years, uh, we've seen mortality rates in excess of uh, 10 or 12 percent in really severe cases, and not quite as bad in adults, but still bad, and occasionally losses in cattle as well. Um, but um, and you can just see to the right there a few of the photos with uh, the sort of uh, um, the staggers and and also uh, cattle. Uh, with heat stress, even on a cool day. I know cattle go and wallow in dams anyway a lot of the time, but they will go uh, into water uh, a lot more uh, when they've um, got heat stress. Um, now, with regard to, I mentioned DAGs before, but uh, trials show comparing a safe endophyte to uh, wild type endophyte, um, there can be up to a one DAG score difference, and that's on a one to five scale. Now, that's that, that's quite significant in terms of extra crutching costs, extra costs associated with that. And also um, 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 uh, uh, the loss of uh, uh, fleece value from a bigger crutch in, in merinos. Um, milk production benefits, I mean, there's good data which shows up to 13% lower uh, milk production when um, uh, cows are grazing. Um, um, uh, high, high, highly toxic pastures and extrapolate that into uh, body weight for lambs with lower lactation or calves. Uh, it, it, that is quite, can be potentially quite significant for prime lambs or for merino lambs at weaning um, if they're lighter body weight, higher risk of ill thrift. Lower fertility. Now there's the direct effect of body weight with fertility um, um, and also there's other effects associated with the heat stress and so on. There's one trial down at Hamilton, which was done years ago, which showed, and well, it was where up at the 18% impact on fertility um, with graving, grazing uh, ellet ryegrass with high wild type endophyte versus nil endophyte. Ellet used to be quite common until people realised it didn't persist with the nil endophyte, but it was quite interesting that the um, uh, related um, uh, through to, uh, from, uh, they ran through on the two pastures from adjoining right way through, and there was an 18 percent difference in 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 uh, uh, conception following uh, uh, mating and and, and lambing percentage as well. So uh, quite, and that's never really been explored in a lot more detail, but it, it it was quite spectacular. One trial, and you really need big numbers to do proper work on on trials to be confident about the results, but. I think um, it, it is definitely a material issue, even if you just take the lower body weight issue. And here's a couple of trials, just very briefly. You can see, and this is run over a couple of months with a couple of different um, um, endophytes with the same 
um, cultivar of uh, ryegrass, and you can see the wild type um, um, uh, ryegrass, the weight gain of the uh, merino years from October to December. And this is when in a period where um, toxicity levels in pasture aren't as high as they are after Christmas. So uh, you can see um, quite a material difference in, in that situation is a couple of kilograms difference in body weight. Now you immediately relate that through to uh, joining percentage. Here's another one uh, with, this was on irrigated pasture on, on a, a controlled uh, trial um, at Dookie where we're mimicking uh, a system to get bad ryegrass uh, staggers with, with the same, again, the same cultivar of ryegrass with wild type AR1 and AR37. But what's really interesting after 300 days, um, there, there was still, there was a five kilogram difference in the body weight of, of ewes, um, even though for half of that trial, there wasn't any real difference in, um, in, in the, um, uh, it, there wasn't any real difference um, in, in the toxic, toxicity levels over uh, winter and, and spring in that trial. So that, that really is scary stuff in my opinion, if you relate that back to a commercial situation that we might be missing out on a, a lot of the potential um, impact of um, wild type perennial ryegrass. Here's a, um, uh, just looking at the rectal temperature and re respiration rate of our views in that October, October to December trial. And you can see that there's a little bit of a difference in, in, in rectal temperature, lowest in AR37, uh, but not a big difference. But um, see how the respiration rate's a lot higher with the wild type endophyte, um, uh, um, uh, trying to manage the heat, heat, heat stress. This is also comparing uh, the staggers um, in, in a trial um, with, uh, well, with both merino and crossbred ewes. Um, in my observation, merinos are a little bit more susceptible, but crossbred still get severe staggers. And as I said before, younger sheep are more vulnerable than older sheep. Um, but here you can see with the wild type endophyte, um, the staggers started at day 44. And they pretty much all had it right the way through for the next 60 days. Um, AR1, no staggers, of course, because it hasn't got lower trim. AR37, there was staggers there, but note how it was, um, uh, it started off a lot slower. And also what it, it doesn't say there, it was less severe, the stagger, the sheep with staggers and the same same sort of trend in, in both the crossbreds and the merinos, um, but it jumped up quicker in the crossbreds, sorry, in the, in the merinos, um, uh, but it, it still wasn't quite as severe in the AR37 uh, compared to the wild type endophyte. So, I mean, in, there's a lot of other impact too. And I mean, of course, with lower body weight, lower sale value, and if you've got staggers um, over summer selling sheep, well, obviously um, you can't um, sell them whilst they've got staggers in terms of the, clearly under the stress of transport, and they'll, they'll get um, uh, cast and so on. So, um, and also the other thing is sometimes if you get an outbreak, um, you can delay uh, classically your second summer drench where staggers starts in February. And so uh, that can have a material impact on the product worm control later on in the year. Weaner ill thrift is a really, really important one. It's all about the body weight of the lambs and continued growth to keep them alive. And grazing the high endophyte pasture, a toxic pasture won't help. Um, it, also extra supplementary feeding will be required to, um, uh, uh, in lieu of the lower body weight, but also uh, sometimes if you remove sheep from toxic pastures and have, have to feed them extra on uh, safe pastures, uh, extra supplementary feeding. A lot of extra labour when you've got a really bad outbreak um, uh, with, with, and I'm sure some of the audience here would be um, um, uh, reminded of those sort of times when they've had bad outbreaks. And there's also an opportunity cost, of course, of not being able to graze high risk pastures over that late summer autumn period in particular. And the huge thing is the farmer stress with major outbreaks. That can be quite daunting, a major outbreak. Um, um, and also with cattle, uh, to a much lesser degree with sheep, but uh, cattle get really stirry. Um, and so there's um, oh and issues with handling cattle. The financial impact of, um, of a, series, um, a, 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 a perennial ryegrass stag is it can, some years it might be two or three or four dollars and other years, uh, severe outbreaks, it could be potentially in excess of $20 per DSE across the farm. So it could have quite a devastating impact. But I, I think I used to say a, a bad outbreak happened 
once every five years. But the reality is we haven't had a really widespread bad outbreak um, for uh, since um, uh, the, the mid uh, mid two thousand and uh, mid mid noughties two thousand and five I think was a pretty bad year, and two thousand and two was another really bad year, and there was a couple, one bad year in the nineties severe um, um, uh, bad year in the nineties. So I mean, if you said over the last thirty years, there's probably been re three widespread severe outbreaks. So one in ten years, it's a pretty short data set, but historically there was also issues, and some people get some every year some. Some going to get it every few years. Um, so um, I've already intimated too that the endophytes concentrated, uh, particularly in the crown um, of, of the plant, in, on when they're grazing that short green pick, also in the leaf sheath, um, um, and also in the in the stem and in the seed. Um, uh, and the classic salmon uh, staggers type scenario is especially after you get summer rain and then you get a prolonged dry warm autumn and so that those plants the, those plants where there's a nice bit of a green pick started to grow and think oh well, that's very good for the stock and then it gets under moisture stress and then the, uh, the stagger starts um, and, and and it's because uh, chasing that little green pick seems to be where the toxin levels are much much um, higher um, also we've seen bad outbreaks um, in where there was a really big spring in 2001 and followed in uh, over the summer of 2001 2 there was a severe outbreak. But uh, partly because there was a huge abundance of really perfect for ryegrass growth um, and there was a really severe outbreak there. So particularly after you've had a big carryover of um, uh, ryegrass over summer. Just a comment there that um, um, if um, seed is stored, for an extended period of time, the endophyte will actually decline in that seed. Um, and so if you buy um, a, a new cultivar of ryegrass with a new beaut, um endophyte, just make sure it's it's um, it's not old seed because the, the endophyte levels will decline sometimes to nothing if it hasn't been stored well. And ideally, uh, you would buy a seed only uh, up to three weeks before you sow it. Um, and so it's storage of uh, seed is really important for any endophyte for, for, to persist in that seed. And, but it, it's, a, it's a been found to be a common cause of poor persistence of new pastures because what you thought you were saying is that um, a, a novel endophyte was actually um, didn't persist in the seed because it wasn't um, looked after properly or was it kept too long before it was sown. Um, and I said our alkali levels tend to be highest in the autumn. This is some data back from um, uh, 2010 and 11 when we were doing some research on it. And you can see there's a number of different sites in Victoria uh, where um, uh, uh, pasture samples were collected monthly and tested for Lolia, Trim B and Ergovalene. And you can see that um, the um, the uh, alkaloid levels for Lolia, Trim B were highest on average in um, late, um, uh, mid to late autumn. Uh, the ergovalene levels were a bit all over the place. They actually peaked in January on average, but, um, and um, there's a reference level uh, le levels down there at, on the bottom. So not all the time they're exceeding the toxic levels, but um, also the other thing too, it's interesting, um, um, alpaca, anybody who has alpacas, excuse me, on, on their farm, it is uh, Lolia trim B. Um, uh, uh, alpacas are incredibly sensitive to it and all can and so get really severe ryegrass staggers, much more severe than sheep. Um, so how can we minimise it? I mean, I, I suppose there's management issues which you, you, you should think well ahead. Uh, so short term things, I mean, early in the season, um, especially if you're a high risk area or a high risk farm, um, is, is graze the high risk paddocks knowing from your previous history, graze them early. Um, and remember to keep the younger stock off those high risk paddocks because they are more susceptible. But ideally you'd graze out those high risk pastures early. So when the riskiest period uh, starts, at least you've utilised those paddocks. Um, you can monitor toxin levels, um, sending lab, lab tests. Um, um, I'm not quite sure there's, there's one lab down at Hamilton, but. Um, uh, southern, uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, at Hamilton, which has historically tested samples 
uh, and I think they did a fair bit of interstate testing too. Um, there's the, the other thing, you can, but we don't normally on, on a routine basis uh, test that unless we're uncertain of what's going on. Um, you can often um, uh, put sentinel sheep on, uh, onto a paddock if, you, if you're wondering, uh, but it does take some time for the to toxicity to develop. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and also, the other thing just uh, with early planning is ensuring your management strategy, such as your second summer drench, jetting for flies, uh, crutching and shearing, um, are out of the way before the highest risk time. So for some people, that might preclude, if there's a high risk of stag, it might preclude late summer um, autumn shearing uh, because um, the disturbance of sheep would be a disaster with trying to crutch or, or shear them at that stage every few years. So be mindful of that. Um, so when a, um, an outbreak um, does occur, um, well, I mean, for a start, minimise the handling. As I said, if you stimulate the sheep, they'll get worse staggers. Uh, but you need to supervise them closely in case these animals are getting cast as well. Um, and ideally, you, if you've got uh, alternative paddocks which are safer and you've got paddocks where they're really struggling, get them, get them off those toxic paddocks. Um, sometimes supplementary feeding, if, if the whole landscape is, is toxic, um, can reduce your ingestion of um, uh, toxin, but it won't eliminate it all. Um, and intensive supervision is really important. So for animals which become rec recumbent, obviously feed and water, they will recover, um, but it, it can be a lot of work if you have a lot of sheep cast. But checking water points, uh, checking uh, paddocks for sheep getting cast is really important. Now, in more recent times, so although they've been around for 10 years now, um, is is there's room in detoxi de detoxifying agents and basically a toxin absorbent, um, uh, Elitoxin Microfix Plus is, I don't, I put Microfix Plus in brackets because I don't know whether it's available at the moment, um, um, but they both have, a, a, a seem to have beneficial uh, effect on, um, uh, on, on the uh, reducing uh, the staggers because they absorb the toxin. Um, and it can be, if, if sheep are faced with grazing toxic pastures and they're really struggling, I think uh, these products, uh, there's a couple of commercial brands, um, it can, can reduce the severity of it and not completely prevent it, but uh, usually it's uh, provided as a dry lick. Um, you, you can, um, uh, uh, but it is quite expensive. I think it's cost up to 30 cents a day if they eat the prescribed amount, which that, that price can quickly add up. So you'd really only really be doing in 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 um, in severe outbreak type situations. Um, but uh, we're explore, exploring other ways to provide uh, the Elitox, whether it can be uh, uh, mixed in with grain, which would be a cost you probably about seven cents uh, a day equivalent, so substantially cheaper. Um, with with um, uh, so there's a uh, there is a few options. We've done trials with. Uh, these products, um, they're hard to do trials because when you set up trials and you don't get staggers in a year, um, it, it gets frustrating. But when um, both, both the products have a material effect on um, reducing the impact of staggers. I, I think the really big one is in the long term, if you've got severe staggers on your property, is to replace the toxic perennial ryegrass pastures. Now, um, now it might mean using novel endophytes such as your yeah, AR37, Endo5 in particular. I haven't had as much mix experience personally with the NEA one. Um, an AR1 I wouldn't recommend because it hasn't got quite as very safe for livestock, but um, um, it hasn't got the spectra of it, it, insect protection. Um, but uh, look, it, it's important to manage the seed, as I said before. Uh, alternatively, um, you could easily go to another pasture species such as um, uh, Phalaris, some of the winter active Phalaris is a fantastically productive as a lot of you are well aware of. So, um, um, but the question with a lot of the newer ryegrasses is their persistence. And there's no doubt big brown in ryegrass, it's hard to, uh, hard to get rid of. And, and actually to remove it from the landscape, if you're trying to, you need to go through a fodder cropping type program to reduce the amount of uh, seed, because even in a drought where you might lose some ryegrass, it, it recruits from seed the following year. So it's, it, it, if you want to get down to the landscape, you have to, it's not just simply a matter of spray topping in spring and sowing your new pasture. It does need uh, a longer period of time to reduce the seed burden. Um, this little thing, I haven't updated, I did it a few years ago, but looking 
at different costs of average costs of perennial ryegrass on uh, pasture and 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 so going from a low level of um, toxicity to quite a high level of uh, impact and what what this actually shows this is comparing sowing with a wild type pasture versus a safe endophyte is and and getting a, a similar return what uh, on investment I think it was about a 30 percent internal rate of return when I looked over a 10-year period and I was with the safe endophyte pasture I was actually over sowing um, 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 uh, just uh, in, in autumn uh, to thicken up the pastures assuming it wasn't persisting quite as well and so I added that cost in as well um, and um, uh, commodity price is a little bit below so the differences would be even bigger now but what it does show that if you've got um, uh, quite a significant penalty associated with perennial ryegrass toxicosis now this not, might be not right across the place it might be just one paddock so but it's relevant for that paddock but if, if, if um, uh, the, uh, to get um, uh, a return on investment in extra carrying capacity with putting wild type endophyte, you're effectively increasing your stocking, need to increase your stocking rate by four or five DSE per hectare. But actually incorporating a safe endophyte and not even increasing stocking rate from the base level, you can see that you can actually um, um, uh, get a very good return on investment. Um, uh, it just replacing the the um, to a safe pasture. Now the reality is, when you put a new pasture in, uh, one of the key objectives would be to run more stock as well. So the return on investment uh, is fantastic. If you're wondering about um, renovating um, uh, a, a toxic pasture which is persistent, uh, consistently toxic. So the key is for that pasture to persist. Okay, when you do it, I mean you don't want to go fly by night and be be back to uh, wild type endophyte in, in two or three years time. Um, so that's enough in, in ryegrass staggers. So uh, uh, Polaris staggers won't take quite as long. Um, it's a, a tryptamine, uh, the alka, there's a number of different alkaloid neurotoxin which affects um, midbrain function now, um, which, which is the primary cause of the alkaloids in the Polaris plant. Um, often we see um, in uh, deficient or marginally deficient cobalt areas, but not always. It doesn't have to be deficient, a cobalt deficient country. But often we see Phalaris staggers when we're on a lighter soil type, so a sandier, a loamy type soil than a heavy clay soil. But again, you can still get Phalaris staggers on heavy soils as well, but more commonly on lighter soil types. All ages of stock are um, affected. You get it more with sheep than cattle, but cattle can certainly get severe staggers. Um, it, what, when we mostly see it, it's, it develop in, in autumn going into winter um, and the onset can take weeks to months after they're grazing that toxic pasture. Um, we don't seem to get nearly as many issues going into the spring but sometimes we do get really chronic effects where animals which uh, there was an impact uh, a, a event with staggers even a couple of years ago, um, uh, mustering those animals can trigger subsequent staggers in one or two of those animals every time they must have, which can be quite off-putting um, if they had a previous outbreak in the mob they were grazing. So um, what we see is, um, um, I mean some areas it, it just it's, it's a really high risk and whatever you're grazing in autumn seems it's on green feed when, when the, 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 the alkaloids are higher not in not necessarily in the dry feed. But we see it particularly in uh, severe outbreaks where there's been an early autumn rain, not enough for a proper break, but you've had good pasture growth, and then those plants become stressed. They're very palatable for livestock, and they will chase them at that time of year because the rest of the grass is pretty poor, but uh, often uh, they're the ones which are particularly um, high risk of uh, alkaloids. Now, I'll just point out there is two syndromes. This I'm talking about um, the staggers here. Uh, there is a, I'll talk briefly about the toxicity and sudden, sudden death in a minute. So with regard to the Phalera staggers, usually the morbidity, or that's basically how many sheep are affected, is usually less than a few percent, less than five percent. But occasionally in severe outbreaks, we've seen 60 or 70 percent affected. Quite catastrophic because most of the ones which gets um, moderate to severe staggers will uh, either be, have to be euthanized or die. Um, Interestingly, kangaroos are incredibly susceptible to it. So often 
um, people will see uh, kangaroos with staggers and they often get it a bit before the uh, sheep and it might be an early warning sign if there's, there's um, alkaloids in the pastures. But um, the clinical signs, um, are not too dissimilar to sheep in a way, but you get a head tremor like sheep. You get an uncoordinated gait, especially in the front legs, but in a wide based stance at the back. And then they'll fall over under uh, stimulation like they do with perennial ryegrass staggers, staggers. And often there's an intention tremor in the terminal stages and con convulsions, and that can take a couple of days from the first signs. Um, the diagnosis is based on normally on, we just do it on clinical signs, um, uh, but you can do post-mortem to confirm, um, and there's characteristic brain pig pigments you can see, I've just pointed, that's a bit subtle there, and that's a, a section of the brain, and you can see there's a brown pigment um, in the uh, brain stem. Okay, so that's, uh, and this is just a video, just a short video I'll show you of um, a sheep with, um, um, if I can, uh, sorry, um, my, um, yep, so you can see it's a bit uncoordinated, but see the wide base stance at the back, and and it's also got to see the head tremor, which is quite, Violent. Now, some a sheep with that sort of severity is almost certainly going to die. Uh, so uh, that's that's sort of uh, it can, different versions. So that that was in a, um, a maiden um, two-year-old ewe that was um, a video was taken in um, June, and they would originally got the staggers um, grazed the toxic pasture, uh, not this pasture they're on now, but grazed the toxic pasture back in April um, after. There was an early autumn rain, lush growth, and which came under moisture stress, a classic situation. So um, uh, with regard to um, treatment, there is none, um, um, unfortunately. Um, and usually if they have moderate staggers, um, they, they are very unlikely to recover, okay? Um, if you find the cheap, the, the mob has got staggers, um, and it's, at the onset's quick, it's more likely to resolve. And so immediately removing them from the toxic pasture is, is uh, critical to minimising the impact. Um, where there are mob which it's fairly subtle and you're watching from a distance and you haven't noticed they've got staggers, sometimes it can creep on up in you. In terms of um, prevention, um, now there's a couple of different options here. Uh, Two, it's recommended that two cobalt bullets, they cost a bit over a dollar each, I think, um, and I think they last for three years. Um, now, they're very commonly used uh, to rectify cobalt deficiency, for example, in the southeast of South Australia, where cobalt's quite deficient, but um, they're quite protective against Valeris staggers as well. And I've seen time and again, people where um, they've forgotten to cobalt um, um, use and suddenly they've got a mob of sheep which we've got um, Phalera staggers. The other alternative, which if, if it's only on one or two paddocks you're not sure what stock are going to run on there, is you can spray with cobalt sulphate at 80 to 100 grams of hec uh, per hectare mixed with water. Now you don't need to go wall to wall but you should spray it once you've got a green pick in the pasture in autumn uh, just before the time it's expected to be toxic based on history. Now I, th I, th I actually think that's a really useful tool when um, uh, you're sowing a new pasture and particularly the new winter active flareses. So if you've had um, um, a really successful establishment um, and particularly where you're in a high risk situation, um, I, I, think, um, uh, uh, I think it's a really important tool. And I think particularly for the first two or possibly three years before the annuals start to creep back into the pasture, just it's so vigorous, uh, the new pasture, and it's, the phalaris is dominating, and, and at that time of year, particularly before the clay set time to get going. Um, you can get the staggers in all cultivars, and the older cultivars are thought to be more toxic than the new ones, they theoretically bred it out, but I'm, I've seen plenty of um, staggers in, in whole past GT, which I think is a wonder, wonderful variety, but, but, and I've seen it in advanced AT, I've seen it in Landmaster. Uh, less so perhaps in straight hold fast, but uh, but certainly it's um, uh, the newer winter active flareses, they are uh, potentially toxic, um, even though um, they state that the risk is lower. I think 
partly because they're so vigorous. And, and so spraying, uh, boom spraying on cobalt sulfate onto those new pastures, I think is quite a useful tool, particularly if in an area which is known to have uh, Valera staggers. Then look, the other thing to do, if you do get an issue, remove them immediately from the toxic pasture um, uh, when clinical signs develop. Um, and, and look, on, on some properties I've seen where they've got incredibly high risk of Phalaris staggers. We unfortunately can't, uh, we don't recommend sowing Phalaris in those particular soil types where there's a history of really regular issues. Um, even with, um, uh, the, you'd have to uh, spray with cobalt sulphate every year, which still might be a good option. Uh, but in some areas we've seen um, yeah, quite severe um, uh, staggers. And so we perhaps avoid those particular paddocks. That's very rarely across the whole landscape. It might be only just one or two paddocks. Okay. Just want to finish up on uh, Phalaris toxicity. Um, now, it, it's also caused by the um, a wide variety of cultivars of Phalaris. Um, and often you see uh, Phalaris toxicity or sudden death. It's after you've had a dry summer autumn period and you get a really good autumn break and suddenly the Phalaris is shooting away. And here's a photo um, I just took yesterday, actually. Just Now that's probably almost a little bit too mature for uh, Phalaris staggers. But the point is that the fresh um, Phalaris pick uh, shoots away first thing to get away. Um, and it's the thing which is potentially toxic. Now, some properties have had a really strong history of Phalaris toxicity but I, I've seen it right across the landscape. And the classic history is cloudy mornings, but not necessarily so. But the really important issue is hungry sheep often just mustered into a fresh paddock. They've been in the yards overnight where they've been drenched first thing in the morning or crutched or something. They're hungry. Um, go back to the, this, uh, the new paddock with a beautiful pick and bang, you kill 10% uh, of them. So um, just be really careful with hungry sheep. And I always emphasize, is make sure that when, when sheep go out of it, um, uh, when they've been off feed, um, make sure that they don't go into a flesh pick just after the Phalaris pick just after the break um, uh, until they've at least got a gut full of uh, feed before they go in there. Um, all cultivars at risk, um, uh, all style types at risk, but it seems to be higher risk again on the lighter soil types. Um, um, and it, uh, interestingly, when somebody rings up and they've got um, Phalaris toxicity. Often I've had a phone call from Western Victoria, Gippsland and um, Southern New South Wales all on the same day. So um, it, it just, it, it, it's, it can be right across the, uh, the landscape where everywhere's had a similar order break, I guess. Okay. So um, as I said, you can get very high death rates. Um, can, uh, can, it's uh, rather disturbing when it does occur, the convulsing frothing at the mouth and they, um, and the head extends back and then they uh, die very quickly. Usually people find them in the uh, paddock death when the, um, it all happens very quickly. Um, um, there's several causes. Um, is, um, the underlying toxins are still a bit uncertain. Uh, several alkaloids are suspected. And also we get a syndrome where it's, they get pneumonia type to toxicity and probably in that situation, the uh, alkaloids are uh, stopping the nitrogen uh, normal nitrogen metabolism pathways. And so uh, excess ammonia accumulation, which can be toxic. Um, there's no treatment. Um, it's unrelated to cobalt. So no protection with cobalt or B12 or anything like that. And also that doesn't seem to be any higher risk where fertilize, nitrogen fertilizers being applied other, other than you might have a really um, a, a aggressive growth, but no higher net risk necessarily there. I think the, the key things are avoid moving hungry sheep under high risk paddocks um, after the seasonal break. That's uh, you, you'll, um, um, but also if you're um, uh, got a rotational grazing system um, and and you've got a long longer rotation still, um, and the sheep are hungry when they go into the next paddock, just in that kind of month or so after the break, make sure that you don't move hungry sheep and um, um, into uh, that beautiful fresh uh, pick of um, Phalaris, the same thing can happen if they've been in the shed overnight. Um, and look at in extreme situations on, on a few farms, I've, I've, we've, um, looked, we've changed pasture species on particularly um, severely affected paddocks. Um, 
Um, and particularly so there's not total reliance on Phalaris. I'm a big fan of Phalaris. Um, even with the um, toxicity and stagus risks, it's a wonderful uh, drought persistent and very productive the species that we directed ones in particular. So it's it, but in, in some situations we do look at alternative pasture species um, where there's a really severe risk. So just finishing up, um, look, perennial ryegrass toxic cases, it's, it's a serious animal health and production limiting issue. It's not just about the staggers. Um, and there's really a whole raft of different production issues. Um, uh, but in saying that there's several strategies that, that are available to minimise the risk while um, improving productivity. And in my opinion, the best long-term control is to replace toxic pastures with more productive cultivars. Uh, and so you lift carry, carrying capacity, but have a huge benefit um, in eliminating that risk of perennial ryegrass staggers. I mean, Polaris staggers, it, it's for some farms, it's a serious issue, um, both the staggers and the sun death. Um, they both can be managed. It, it really takes close monitoring and understanding those risks uh, to minimise the potential impact. So look, I've said enough there. There's a lot of, um, I haven't uh, added some references there, but there's a lot of information online from um, uh, from the various state department of agriculture and, and um, MLA as well. Uh, there's a number of really good reports um, uh, discussing perennial ryegrass toxicosis as well. So, okay, look, I might leave it over to, um, uh, open to uh, questions now, Peter, if there's anything. No problem, Snap. Thanks very much for that. No, no, it was an excellent pre presentation, um, very detailed. We've got some, some questions already through. Um, some have been answered, so I won't bother about repeating anything that's clearly spelled out in the, in the presentation. If anyone isn't happy that their questions haven't been uh, answered fully, just send me a, a, an email, you have my contact details. Uh, so the first one we'll go with Johnny is on DAG score um, and resistance to endophyte or developing DAG is a heritable trait. Look, is it, uh, DAG, DAG, DAG score is a heritable trait. Right? It is actually moderately heritable too. So that means you can make material gains in um, in your selection program now. The problem is there's not a lot of information. There, there is an ASBB for uh, dagginess of sheep, um, and um, uh, but there's not a lot of um, uh, of um, ram breeders have uh, got um, the ability to uh, select uh, for it because uh, if they're not from areas which dags occur, so. Um, I mean, if you're buying sheep from the Riverina, you're very unlikely to get much information on DAG schools for Western Victoria or Tasmania. Or, or if you're buying even up in Northern Tidelands in New South Wales, uh, where they have the main cause of dagginess is actually uh, black scow worm or, or the trike stromulus species. And, and the trike up in Northern New South Wales doesn't, uh, the species up there doesn't cause as much uh, scouring so there's not as much scouring up, up in the northern tablelands compared to um, uh, southern Victoria, southwest slopes, uh, south, East, south Australia and Tasmania. But I mean look the um, and, and, and the, the, her the, the trait which is has uh, um, got a moderate heritability it's primarily um, um, uh, related to uh, worms and so I couldn't say that selecting against DAGs will actually, um, um, uh, uh, you'll, you'll actually, whether it's got the same heritability when we're talking about the perennial ryegrass toxicosis. But it certainly um, uh, is, is, is a, um, um, uh, yeah, it is a heritable trait. And I know some people, particularly in the post mulesing environment, it's, it's actually a pretty important one if you're running um, uh, unmules sheep in a, uh, an environment when you can get dags. It's it's not only about bear breach, it's all, also about the dagginess of the sheep as well. There's just not a lot of information unless you're breeding your own rams where, where you've got total control of, um, and you can uh, 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 select and certainly there's I know, of, of some producers who, who are doing that and, and they've got, um, they've, they've included dagginess in their selection index. All right, uh, John, so just a little bit more on that question. So it's, Susan's after, um, 
the question is, is selection for low DAG relevant only to rams or worth doing on use too? I would also put in that, is it, 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 do you see benefit in selecting for low DAG or end of flight um, uh, resistance? Uh, well, I, I think I, I think the dagginess seems to relate, I mean, I might correct me if I'm wrong here, but it relates to the low atrium actually. Um, so if you've got a um, pasture which has some got low atrium, the, the, the risk with dagginess is not nearly as great. Okay, and, and yeah. certainly it, it's not with the ergovalian component. So uh, the wild type pastures are uh, a much higher risk of dagginess compared to the uh, newer uh, uh, type cultivars. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, so that's that sort of thing. Yes, the, the newer cultivars is lower dag, dag risk, and 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 that's certainly a factor in in. And I mean, it really becomes to the point here in the decision making for people who aren't mulesing. Now, the other part of that question related is it worthwhile um, uh, selecting uh, 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 use, uh, use as well if you're in your own. Um, um, it is repeatable the dagginess, so you will make if, if, if uh, um, it will you will make gains uh, over the lifetime of that sheep if it's um, daggy. As a young sheep, it's more likely to be daggy for the rest of its life, um, and also you will improve the rate of genetic gain if you include uh, dagginess in your selection index. But you've got to be mindful of how many traits you've got in your selection index. You'll you'll I mean uh, for a wool flock. Um, um, uh, fibre diameter and fleece weight are still the most important um, factors to um, remember. So, I mean, the more traits you put in there, um, the, the slower you, you progress on, on all traits. So, but I mean, in, in some areas, I, I wouldn't rate it highly. In other areas, I think it's actually really important um, if, in the post mills environment. Sure. Thanks for that. Uh, John. Now, um, this one might require um, some papers, so we, uh, there's a couple of questions that are quite technical, John, so we won't have to necessarily answer them today, but we might be able to signpost people to resources. The first one's on Elliot Tox, so mm -hmm. um, we're after some more information on, on evidence of, it, of its, uh, how effective it is. Right, okay. And, um, I believe um, you've answered, there's a second part to the question. How do you manage the dose required? I believe you've answered that with the grain component and, and as your um, carrier, but I'll, I'll throw that to you. Well, uh, for the fir first first one, um, I've um, uh, with the Elotox, I've um, um, what evidence? Um, there was a trial done um, in uh, Brian Lurie was the lead author. You'll be able to download it from the. Uh, which I think it was 2014 or 15 it was completed, um, um, or, which, which looked at perennial ryegrass toxicosis, where there, there was some published work in that trial, both in terms of pen, pen studies um, showing the, um, uh, the uh, clear evidence with regard to the temperature, um, reduced uh, temperature load. Um, and uh, secondly, as part of that trial, there was a um, uh, part of that, the bigger part of that trial, uh, and I was actually involved involved in that trial where I actually um, did, and I was beaten by a drought one year. The, the other year I was beaten by, it was ridiculously wet and there was um, really low endophyte levels in pastures in all of autumn because it was so wet. And I think in the third year, I opportunistically waited till there was some um, ryegrass staggers and quickly set up a trial. but. What actually happened in that trial? I didn't get any body weight responses, uh, but I got um, um, uh, there was um, um, a third of the amount of staggers in the uh, trial um, uh, uh, over the period of the trial. There was a third of the amount of staggers. Um, now I, I will I, I, I could um, I haven't got it off the top of my head, but I can pass on to you the link to that uh, paper. Uh, there's also uh, some work which uh, Kevin Reed did, which he published with uh, Microfix, which I'm not quite sure whether it's available at the moment, but but he, he got um, uh, incredible behavioural differences with uh, sheep supplemented with Microfix. Um, I think they were provided in a block and 
the ones which had mica fix all sort sort, sort shade. All the ones which are, uh, didn't have mica mica fix were showing showing signs of heat stress, but ironically didn't go and seek shade because they were so frazzled or something. I'm not quite sure, but there was um, in that trial. I remember there was about a 30 gram uh, per day difference in weight gain. Now that doesn't sound like much between the two trials, but it was statistically significant. And over a period of um, 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 uh, the, the period of the trial, there's a one a potentially a one and a half kilogram difference in the live weight of the weaner. Now for a merino weaner, one and a half kilograms is is a difference between a healthy weaner and one which is vulnerable. Um, so, and the other thing, there was differences in um, uh, fertility of the ewes when they were carried through um, uh, to uh, uh, joining, but uh, the, the, because the numbers weren't big enough, you need really big numbers to get statistical differences with uh, mating, but it did make a difference. Now, back to the second part of that question, and look, I haven't got quite got to the answer to this because um, I have uh, people that have had severe staggers have suggested they try the um, uh, the Elotox as a loose lick. Now, um, the problem with that, um, the current price of it, 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 it's actually gone up a long way. So it's 30 cents a, a day, it appears to be, if they take in the recommended dose of 10 grams a day of the of the lick. Now, and at, at $3, um, um, uh, um, it, 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 it's starting to, uh, it, it just, um, 30, 30 cents a day, it, it's it's quite a big cost and that will add up very quickly. Every 10 days it's $3. So that um, is, all the, uh, uh, in my opinion, a bit too expensive, even with the current high commodity prices. Now, on the back of that, I've, I've started making inquiries about um, of, of whether it, how well it can, if it can be added to grain um, as, uh, as, as a supplement. Uh, it's a very low dose. Uh, there's issues with Doing that, but I, I don't unfortunately have the answer to that one. But it would be um, um, less than it's it's about a quarter of the cost, which would be uh, certainly acceptable. But I'm just um, haven't done any trials with that. But it's the same. If we can deliver the compound that way, that'd be better. But I haven't quite got the answer to that yet. Um, the, that one yet, because I was only investigating. I thought uh, I thought better get uh, what the current price of the um, of of the loose slick is at the moment. But the one um, 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 wholesale, uh, the one company which there's a couple of companies which provide it, and, and the price of theirs was quite expensive, or a lot more expensive than what it has been previously. Okay, it's always uh, been expensive, but I, yeah, so I haven't got all the answers to that one yet, uh, but I'll, I'll provide you with some of those links for yeah, that. No problem, John. I, I've just shared a link with the group, everyone who's still on, um, referencing an MLA um, report. So um, I'll check that off with John uh, when we go offline. Um, so just a couple more questions, John, and we'll, we'll bring it to a close. Um, so a lot of new varieties of Phalaris state low alkaloids. What is low? What, is there a standard measurement for alkaloids? Well, it's more about uh, with the new varieties um, is the um, endophyte that you're dealing with, okay? So, um, so AR37, Endo5, I've both had experience with both those endophytes and this sort of, um, it's certainly, um, the AR37 is probably a safer one with cattle uh, than, than sheep. Um, they both have enough uh, safe alkaloids in those, um, uh, cold, uh, in those endophytes to, um, Keep the insects at bay. Uh, at bay, uh, they um, and they produce toxins which aren't to uh, aren't damaging to livestock. The AR thirty seven it can produce a janthinum, which is janthotrim, which is not the same as liliotrim B. Uh, it still causes staggers, but not as severely. But in my experience, I've seen with some of AR thirty seven pastures under ideal conditions, I've still still seen pretty bad staggers with sheep. So it's more about the endophyte that you're dealing with. And I, I haven't had as much experience with uh, uh, the, um, uh, not pro how they pronounce, um, in endophytes. Uh, there is a number of them around, um, but uh, there's a neat, and then a neat two and a neat four. 
Um, and so they're advancing these endophytes all the time. The one which looks like it's fantastic is the um, U2, but that's really in fescues, unfortunately. Uh, it, it's very impressive with no animal effects and a much broader spectrum of activity, including crickets. Um, uh, for, for, um, uh, but it's in the fescues and festuoliums, um, the, the hybrid one. So, um, yeah, but I mean, um, there, there's other ones that are developing. Um, most of that research has been done in New Zealand. Um, and it perhaps reflects in some of, I, I don't know anybody who hasn't been totally satisfied with persistence of most of the newer cultivars. But um, I mean, to me, um, it's not just about replacing your ryegrass with ryegrass. There's opportunities to look at some Polaris um, and um, other, other um, varieties which might suit the landscape uh, better, be more drought uh, tolerant and, and every bit of as productive or more, or certainly more productive than old big perennial ryegrass. So I think, yeah, that's what it's, it's really about. But the AR37, um, I've got my own personal opinions about a few of the different varieties, but I don't, I don't think there's any value in talking about that now. I think there's a really useful resource um, on MLA um, uh, uh, where they've combined all the uh, uh, productivity um, the trials of all the different varieties. Um, now I've just forgotten the na name of that um, um, uh, tool, um, but it's it's a really where um, uh, where they've got all the uh, pasture varieties uh, and showing the different productivity. They haven't got a lot of um, persistence data in those trials, um, and they're not um, tested under grazing conditions. Although hopefully over time there will be more persistence to come up. Out because those trials are added to. So that gives a, a good spectrum of um, the, um, the uh, productivity of, of, of some of the new cultivars and a little bit of the persistence data, but it's pretty, um, uh, not a lot of the persistence data. And I think that's a really important part of the whole, 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 whole game. So, um, yeah, so to me, about, if, if it's, it's mostly about the AR37 and and endo five and neat seems to uh, just seems to be um, safe for livestock and have good insect coverage. So it, it should be in that mix too. But selecting you, you get uh, some of the cultivars have actually uh, had different uh, 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 some of available with wild type endophytes, some with AR one and AR thirty seven, all the uh, same cultivar. So when you're buying um, the um, uh, your, your, your eyegrass, just make sure you've got uh, the safe, uh, safe um, endophyte. And I'm just really wary of, um, of, of going wild type endophytes when I look at uh, some of the, uh, 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 the toxicity uh, data there. But I've also got to be mindful in certain environments where it might be a pretty tough environment where the perennial ryegrass, uh, big perennial ryegrass still grows um, as almost as a weed. It's, it's, it's 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 a much better variety than silver grass and and barley grass and, and the like, but um, uh, for productivity. But I I do prefer some of the newer varieties, particularly in the more favourable environments um, from um, animal performance. It, it quite spectacular differences. But I, I I'm not just looking at the rye grasses. I I look at the other cultivars as well. All right. Other um, species, other species as well. John, I've got a few more, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna respond to some people. Georgie, obviously your question related on alkaloids and phalaris, we'll come back to you on that. Um, we've got Cameron as well asking to rate phalaris cultivars in order of toxicity, so we'll do that offline, John. Uh, but it sounds like MLA's tool might be beneficial there. Is that correct? Yeah. Look, it it, it the tool. Um, 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 oh. I, I should be kicking myself. It's just, it's on the tip of my tongue. Sorry, um, uh, but no, that doesn't rate the toxicity of the different cultivars. Look, there's not a lot of good information on the on the alkaloid, the safety um, of the different cultivars. Uh, that some of the new newer varieties, which uh, were bred uh, allegedly to be safe, in my opinion, uh, are not totally safe. Uh, I think I've seen uh, Phalera staggers and toxicity. I think in virtually all. Uh, the cultivars available. I don't think I haven't seen. Um, uh, yeah, but I don't think there's a um, a um, uh, cultivar of Phalaris where I haven't seen issues with. And I think I've been. 
hold fast GT, one of the more recent ones, I've um, it certainly uh, was bred to be allegedly reasonably safe, but it's certainly I, I've seen problems. But I just wonder whether it's because it's so productive and out competes everything else. Um, uh, but uh, I, my observation of places, the highest risk is in the first couple of years, and that's where I think using the cobalt can be quite useful. Um, in, 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 and it's quite cheap um, uh, 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 to, to uh, boom spray across. And like I said, you don't have to do every corner of the paddock. I mean, doing two thirds of the paddock is probably sufficient um, uh, sure. to, to, to get enough protection. Okay. A uh, quick one here, John. Uh, Elliot talks, is it the same as Pro Pharma Weather Shield? Uh, yes. Okay, excellent. Yep. And then two uh, kind of situational scenarios. So uh, after summer rain, if the lowest growth is dominant within the sward and then a dry period occurs to stress plants, it, uh, so high risk time for staggers, how long can that regrowth remain toxic? What would be the safe grazing approach for the situation? Wait for a proper autumn break or until other annuals dilute the effect? The dilute well, it, it depends. I suppose it depends on the history of the property for a start. Have they had previous episodes of Polaris staggers? If they have, then I'd take a more cautious approach. Or if it's a, if it, if it's a new pasture, which is a fantastically productive, um, I would take a more cautious approach um, how long is it toxic for? Um, look, it, it's a bit of a data for his own, unfortunately, but I think the, the, the toxicity probably declines by, um, certainly by winter, but um, I've seen staggers in uh, stock which have went on to a pasture in winter, so that's not always the case. Uh, our under, I mean, the problem with it is we're not quite sure what's actually the key um, would be a lot more informed if we knew, knew what are the specific alkaloids which cause the um, uh, the staggers yep. um, and the toxicity, and and we're not unfortunately. So I'm I'm basing my observations on uh, my comments on what I've seen practically in the field, and I mean there's been some work done on it, but it's 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 been not not hasn't hasn't been um, clear enough to make any recommendations from it. But yep. I do think. Um, the highest risk, obviously, after it becomes uh, moisture stressed, and most of the cases, uh, I think, it, most of the discussion about Blairus staggers disappears by uh, the end of June. But that might be a long time to keep um, uh, animals, a ridiculously long time to keep animals off a, um, yeah. a, pad, uh, off a paddock. So that's where I think, well, why not you, you do your cobalt sulfate trick? And don't do copper sulfate, it won't do the job I've had. I mentioned the cobalt sulfate and somebody uh, uh, top dressed with copper sulfate and uh, there was no effect at all, <laughs> of course. So, um, but the, um, so the, um, uh, yeah, so anyway, so it's, it's a, um, uh, unfortunately, if we had, if we knew exactly what the alkaloids were, I'd be able to give you much more specific advice on that. So just with that answer, questions quickly come up, if you could address that, John. So would administering cobalt through a lick block, would you get a, a sufficient intake there for Phalaris staggers? I I um, haven't tried a lick block. It it may theoretically work, but I um, uh, I, I I just haven't had seen any evidence to uh, uh, recommend it. Um, um, I, I, I'm I'm sure I'm surprised. Actually, in thinking about it, I'm surprised it hasn't. Um, uh, I, I suspect it probably doesn't work in that if it, if it did, would know about it, um, would be uh, a, a, a perhaps, a, a, but uh, that's not based on anything. So I can't really make it, uh, a, uh, any conviction about the uh, cobalt um, blocks, uh, but that's certainly the ones which I do know work is, is the bullets um, and the uh, cobalt um, uh, top dressing the pastures. But I've, I've seen over in South Australia where it's really high risk on the limestone country, um, where people have perhaps just forgotten to um, uh, to uh, bought some young sheep, uh, put them into a Phalaris paddock, and and they've they've got some of them got Phalaris staggers, or or, or 
where, um, where, where they've got just one area and they use a cobalt sulfate and they've forgotten to top dress with cobalt sulfate and they've suddenly got um, Phalaris staggers. So it certainly works in those high risk situations. It's just a matter of whether, I mean, if you have never had any history of a problem, um, your, your risk is probably pretty low if you've been there for a long time. But if, if you hear a lot of noise in the district about Phalaris staggers, I, I'd be, I'd take a bit more cautious approach, particularly when you, you sell a new paddock. And, and I, I, I've seen enough with new Polaris pastures to, to recommend where I think there's a risk in that landscape to, um, to do the cobalt uh, spray thing just for those first two years, because um, uh, certainly the consequences can be rather um, uh, devastating if, if you get a bad uh, dose and you, and you miss it. Often you can nip it in the bud if you see you start to get staggers and, and, and the losses will be minimal. But, um, but if, 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 if you think, oh, it should be going really well and don't take a close look at it, that's, um, then they're all going well. Suddenly you find you've got a lot of staggers and, it's, and they've been on there for too long to get any recovery. Sure. Um, just quickly, final two questions for the night. Uh, so that uh, someone's asked if you can replace cobalt with a B12 supplement, or does it have to no, be cobalt? No, actually, good, good question. Uh, no, uh, B12 has no benefit whatsoever. Okay. So uh, that's yeah, really good. I should have mentioned that in the talk. So good question. Thanks for that. Now, David's just sound looks like David. Oh, no, no, I'll just make one comment on that. It's yep. probably because the, uh, the the B12 is given as an injection, um, um, whereas is I think what's actually happening is the cobalt complexes in the rumen uh, may be deactivating the alkaloids in the rumen. Okay, okay. so yeah, yep. So that's the mode of action. Excellent, John. Uh, so I think David's left, but we're still. This is our final question for the evening. Thanks for all sticking around. Um, so Dave's not sure when to graze both ryegrass and phalaris. We have good summer ray, it's decent regrowth, but I'm not confident to put stock on until the end of March. So they're in Vic, just north of, of Clunes. Is it Clunes? Oh, have I got that right? Hopefully. Yeah, well, well my, my comment up there, you can uh, get, both, you know, I've seen plenty of bad ryegrass staggers up there, and I've seen, actually, uh, uh, I've seen, uh, uh, haven't seen, but I've heard of uh, quite bad Phalaris staggers in that area, particularly on the uh, sedimentary soils, not on the, um, the basalt country. I don't think it's quite as high risk um, uh, with, with the uh, Phalaris um, uh, 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 staggers. So, look, I, I, my, my comment, look, if, if um, to me, the, the, the Phalaris, sta uh, Phalaris is is more an issue in terms of loss of sheep if it's unmanaged, okay? But at the very least, um, if you watch them really closely and just that the first signs of staggers get them out of there um, would be the, the, the very least. Um, and with the phalaris staggers, oh, sorry, with the ryegrass staggers too, I mean, if, if, if they do go on there and if this is a wild type um, ryegrass, then um, look, there's a pretty high risk at the moment, and that risk may persist um, uh, through to when you get a proper autumn break. Now, for some people, that actually might be um, up at, um, might be uh, if the forecast is right on top of rain they've just had, it might be the start of a really good autumn break. So, with with the ryegrass stags in particular, once you get a good autumn break, you're pretty much away. But the only thing I'd even caution, even if it's if you did get a what was a good order break now, it can, can turn into a false break. So the staggers could start later on, but I'd graze it whilst you're not getting staggers. I've got no problem with that at all. But the, the flares, I, I, I just take a more con conservative approach, but it depends if your property hasn't had any um, flares staggers previously. Well, I think the risk, to be perfectly honest, is reasonably low because you would have had plenty of other years where you've had it um, early rain and, and it's come under a bit of moisture stress like it might have in recent times. So yeah, look, I, I, I think with the flares to me, it's a matter of really watching them closely. Um, and like I said, if, if it's a high risk area, I've got no problems with uh, doing the, the cobalt sulphate on, on those pastures in a year like this. Okay. Um, 
All right. So that's uh, that's everyone done and dusted there. Thanks for sticking around. Um, John, thanks for the detailed questions. And, and there will be all, all the A's with John. If there's any questions there that John wants to add a bit more detail to or provide resources, we'll put it up with the recording of uh, tonight's yeah. webinar. So no. thanks, John, um, and thanks to everyone for sticking around. Please, we value your feedback, so um, complete the short survey on the way out. Thanks again, and we'll see you in a fortnight's time. Thanks, John. Good, good stuff. No. Thank you. So that's all. Um, um, I'll get those. Uh, I'll, I've got a couple of those references.